Executive Vice President of the Council for Agricultural Science and Technology, known as CAST. Uh, we are a membership-based uh, nonprofit organization that is based in Ames, Iowa. Uh, we are an uh, organization that's made up of many uh, members, including scientific societies, nonprofit organizations, companies, universities, and many individuals who uh, come together to support uh, science communication and helping um, advance the understanding of science and its use, particularly in policy areas. I'd like to thank AOCS and particularly Pat Donnelly for allowing us to be here to share our latest CAS report with you this morning. CAS mission is pretty simple. Uh, through our network of experts, we interpret, assemble, interpret, and communicate credible science-based information and for us, our primary audience is policymakers, media, and the public. <coughs> the CAST vision of world where decision making related to agriculture and natural resources is based through credible information developed through reason, science, and consensus building. Pictured here is Dr. Norman Borlaug, who plays a very important role, not only in the history, but kind of the, where CAST is going in terms of its vision. Uh, Dr. Borlaug, a noted uh, Nobel laureate, uh, founder of the World Food Prize, scientist, uh, important contributor to uh, food security around the world, was also the uh, lead author of Cass' first publication. Some of the last writing that Dr. Warlock did before his uh, death was a preface to a Cass paper. And he plays an important part in, in our organization, and, and we try to emulate kind of the ideals that he set forward particularly as it relates to the use of science to help improve mankind. What do we do? Basically, we disseminate science-based information through printed materials, through online resources, through videos that you'll find on YouTube uh, websites. We've also recently started the translation of many of our materials into uh, both Ch uh, Spanish and, and uh, Chinese translations of our selected publications. And I'll show you a little bit about where people are downloading or accessing our publications. But again, it's to share our scientific science information resources broadly with people around the world. How do we do it? Well, CAST has a pretty small staff. We do it through a lot of volunteers. We've got over 50 members that serve on various uh, boards of scientific societies, nonprofits, universities. We do it through a task force. All of our CAST publications are put together by a task force of subject matter experts scientists, legal scholars, um, who volunteer their time to put these together. If we look back over about the last 10 years, we've used about 650 volunteers that have come together to, to produce CAS publications. When you look at the makeup of that group, about 65% of them come out of academia, about 15% from government, 15% from companies, and 5% from nonprofits. When we do our publications, we do a series of formats. Uh, we have our issue papers, our special publications, our task force reports, commentaries, and our quick cast. Today, we're sharing with you a special publication. Um, we'll this year, in 2018, probably release about eight to nine different publications. We've already released three of those uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, this one here today, uh, these are some of our other publications that we have and we'll be releasing over the next few months. A paper on genome editing and agriculture, impact of free range poultry systems on animal health, human health, uh, environment, food safety, and animal welfare, and a paper uh, later this summer, early fall, on food loss and waste. And we have another, a number of publications moving through our production pipeline that we expect to roll out this fall as well. One of the things that we do is we publish a weekly newsletter called Friday Notes, and it comes out every Friday uh, as a way to kind of share what's happening uh, around the world in science. We look at plant, animal, food types of topics. We look both uh, within the U.S. and internationally. And what we're really looking at is trying to kind of lift up those areas where science and policy intersect. And it's not our role to take a position on the policy, but it is there to say what does the science say and helping people understand a lot of the underlying science that, that is important for the policy. Um, we uh, it also concerns a lot of information and, and trying to relate what's happening in Washington, D.C. and kind of give the science context to that. <coughs> We're an organization that's always looking for good ideas. And if you go to the front page of our website, you'll find a submitted idea button. And it used to be that meant you download a two-page form and you fill it out and send it. 
Now it's really just three questions, your name, your contact information, your idea, and why you think it's important. We take these ideas, we vet them through our various work groups. We have a work group that focuses on animal science, a work group that focuses on plant science, and a work group that focuses on food science. They, they discuss these ideas, and if they see merit to these ideas, they'll follow up with you and, and bring those ideas forward. And again, our role is really to help almost in this translation of a lot of the technical science in terms of how do we better inform the, the non-scientists and help them elevate their understanding and the importance of science, particularly as it relates to, to policy areas. Again, a little bit about CAST, and if you notice in the picture on the, the uh, lower right, you'll see the red dots, and you'll see a lot of red dots of the United States and growing red dots around the world. And some of this has been attributed to uh, interest and access to our uh, science-based communication information, the translation of this into Spanish and into Mandarin Chinese is helping us with that. We continue to grow in that area. I want to make sure that we're serving an audience not just here in the U.S. or in North America, but worldwide. It's my pleasure at this time to introduce our, our um, keynote presenter, Dr. Donald Bites. Uh, Dr. Bites is the uh, Charles F. Curtis Distinguished Professor of Agriculture at Iowa State University. Uh, he joined Iowa State University in 1967 after receiving his bachelor's and master's degree at the University of Illinois and his PhD at Michigan State. Uh, he has uh, advised in his career of over 50 years now of, of teaching, research, and advising graduate students, has done some tremendous work, particularly as it relates not only to animal science, but the understanding of, of a lot of the dietary science as well. He's also been very active with our organization, having served in many leadership roles within CAST, including his served as president of CAST a few years ago, and continues to be an important advisor to CAST, particularly as it relates to uh, the work that we do around food and better understanding uh, the intersection of the science. So at this time, please help me welcome, and, and let me, before I introduce Don, there is a copy of the paper and the executive summary, and I'll be passing those out as Don starts his presentation. Don, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to see so many of you here. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you a bit about omega-3 fatty acids and uh, their role in our uh, daily lives. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, coordinating a publication that uh, you will have a chance to receive uh, that describes uh, omega-3 fatty acids and their role in uh, potentially improving our uh, daily health. So it's good to see all of you. The, uh, the publication was put together by some experts in uh, the uh, field of omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, William Vance from Southern Illinois University, Tom Grana from Cornell University, and uh, now at the University of Texas, Bill Calder at the University of Southampton, and Deborah Dearson Shady put together some of the information on health claims. And so it's a team effort, for sure, to put together this uh, particular uh, publication. The uh, presentation that I'd like to use today is, is shown on this page. Uh, I'd like to uh, emphasize first uh, nomenclature, making sure we're on the same page as far as understanding nomenclature, interconversions of omega-3 fatty acids to each other, foods rich in omega-3 fatty acids, if you want to increase the omega-3s in your diet, how do you do that, biological significance of some talk, some discussion about the potential health benefits. How can we increase the omega-3 fatty acids in our food as a way of increasing the natural intake of omega-3 fatty acids? A short discussion on claims and then some concluding comments. So first I'd like to talk a bit about the nomenclature of the omega-3 fatty acids. Well, um, the omega-3 fatty acids, the main ones that we'll talk about are indicated on this page. Uh, the top one, the alpha-linolenic acid, an omega-3 fatty acid. Uh, anyway, 
omega-3 fatty acid. What omega-3 means is that the uh, three carbons from the omega end, if you consider the carboxyl, the uh, alpha end, then the opposite end is omega. And so if there's a double bond, three carbons from the methyl end of that fatty acid, that's considered an omega-3 fatty acid. And they have a uh, special uh, uh, effect on that. Uh, Alkalinolenic acid, or abbreviated uh, ALA. Uh, Icosapentanoic acid, EPA. Uh, Icosa meaning 20, so 20 carbons. Penta, five double bonds. Uh, EPA is the common term that I will use for that. Docosahexanoic acid, 22 carbon, with uh, six double bonds, and those are the three major uh, fatty acids, the uh, EPA and DHA are considered long chain omega-3 fatty acids and uh, uh, in contrast to uh, 18-3, the alkalinolenic acid. Omega-6 have uh, interactions with omega-3 that I'll illustrate a bit. The uh, major one there is uh, linoleic acid, C18-2, and you see that's an omega-6, the so double bond, six carbons from the methyl end. And arachidonic acid, uh, C20 with four double bonds, that's actually uh, can be synthesized and is synthesized in our bodies from linoleic acid. The reason omega-3 fatty acids have gained so much notoriety is their potential health benefits, and I'd just like to emphasize that at the outset. Um, first, uh, the uh, Potential health benefits relate to lowering blood triglycerides. Uh, rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory disease has uh, uh, omega-3 has some impact on that, it seems. Uh, depression, baby development, asthma, uh, ADHD, uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and even cancer. So there's a broad range of potential health benefits that the omega-3 fatty acids seem to be associated with. And I'd like to emphasize that, some of that uh, information in a bit more detail a bit later. The uh, omega-3 fatty acids interact with the omega-6 uh, uh, in an important way, and I'd like to illustrate that. Uh, omega-6 fatty acids, uh, showing the first one listed is lino the uh, linoleic acid which is an essential fatty acid, by the way. I forgot to mention they're essential because we can't place, we uh, in our bodies can't place the double bond at the carbon number 12 in that particular fatty acid. Um, so linoleic acid, essential fatty acid, is uh, used for the conversion to arachidonic acid that I'll illustrate a bit later, it has very important roles in the production of lycosinoids, uh, prostaglandins and related molecules. Omega-3 fatty acid, um, alkalinolenic acid, C18-3, that too is an essential fatty acid. We can't place the double bonds at, at the delta 9-12 position in that particular acid. Steroidonic acid can be synthesized uh, from uh, linoleic acid by uh, desaturation reaction. And uh, that fatty acid is of some significance in that it uh, seems to be synthesized at greater rates to uh, EPA and DHA than is uh, linoleic acid. Uh, so there's some emphasis in, in uh, causing plants to synthesize steroidonic acid. Um, steroidonic acid converted to EPA and uh, to uh, EPA then uh, further elongated to the 22 carbons to uh, docosahexanoic acid involving another desaturation. Um, one of the important aspects related to the interconversions of, of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids to each other is that C8, uh, the omega-6 has some influence on the rate at which linoleic acid is converted to EPA and DHA. EPA and DHA can be synthesized in our body from linoleic acid, um, not efficiently, but it does occur. Um, and that's important because, as I'll show 
Later, DHA is of major significance in several tissues of our body, such as retina and brain. But omega-6 fatty acids can influence the rate at which um, linolenic acid is converted to EPA and DHA. And that, in that case, uh, higher linoleic acid, omega-6 linoleic acid, can decrease the conversion of linolenic to DHA and EPA. Well, uh, how do we uh, get omega-3 fatty acids into our body? Well, we have to consume them because we can't make the linolenic acid, as I mentioned. Uh, omega-6 fatty acids, uh, important ones uh, in our diet, vegetable oil, safflower oil is probably one of the richest practical foods for uh, content of linoleic acid. 74% of fatty acids are uh, linoleic acid. <clears throat> Solid dressings, nuts and seeds, so you see uh, snacks, Fast foods, cookies, and, and candies because they contain uh, soy oil and other plant oils in the ingredients. Pork foods contain a small amount of linoleic acid, chicken, dairy, and eggs even less, and beef uh, even less than uh, uh, pork products. So omega-6 uh, fatty acids, uh, especially linoleic acid in our diet is of significance because it's essential. Uh, top 10 foods uh, in omega-3 fatty acids, uh, flaxseed oil, flaxseed oil, about 50% 50, 50 of the fatty acids in linseed oil or flaxseed oil is uh, linolenic acid. Fish oil, uh, fish oil uh, like from salmon, uh, major uh, omega-3 fatty acids in fish oil is and DHA, the long chain uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Chia, also a, a rising uh, popular uh, food, uh, is uh, rich in uh, C18-3 linolenic acid. And it's, uh, uh, in, well, it's got higher uh, antioxidant activity, and so the uh, fatty acids in chia seem to be protected a bit more than those in flaxseed oil. Walnut, uh, walnuts, uh, fish, uh, caviar, for example, uh, well, that'd be the uh, long chain omega-3 fatty acids. Cured or canned fish, fish, mackerel, uh, soybeans, uh, seafood, uh, such as oysters, uh, small amounts of the EPA and DHA, and a bit of linolenic acid in, in uh, spinach as an example of some uh, vegetables. Well, the biological significance of omega-3 fatty acids can be expressed in different ways. Popularity can be uh, shown uh, just by doing a Google search. If you do, do a Google search on uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, you'll get, uh, uh, well, I did this a few days ago, 37 million hits. So many people are interested in omega-3 fatty acids scientific point of view, from a medicinal point of view, from a food supplement point of view, etc. Research-wise, PubMed uh, search uh, gave uh, 24,000 citations. So obviously a molecule of major interest, uh, class of molecules of major interest by uh, different researchers. Uh, many studies have been done on showing effects on neural tissue and cardiovascular system, uh, major of course, cardiovascular disease, a major killer of uh, people. Relatively high concentrations are present in the uh, retina and the brain. Many effects result from the uh, conversions of uh, omega-3 fatty acids to glycosinoids and related molecules. It seems to be this to be the major uh, biological action of these uh, molecules. Um, much emphasis has been placed on increasing omega-3 fatty acids in food and in increasing our intake, especially of EPA and DHA. Uh, the Institute of Medicine, the 
You might ask, how, so how much do you consume? Well, that's not really been defined. There's no uh, recommended dietary allowance been established for omega-3 fatty acids. But the Institute of Medicine has uh, stated that uh, uh, adequate intake uh, would be about half a gram a day for young uh, children and uh, about a gram to uh, 1.6 grams a day for females and males. Um, other organizations have established uh, recommended uh, intakes, uh, WHO, 0.3 to 0.5 grams a day, uh, uh, and other agencies, uh, half a gram to a gram a day of omega-3 fatty acids could lead to some potential health benefits, but no specific RDA has yet been established for uh, the uh, EPA and DHA especially. We, uh, we do know that the omega-3 linolenic acid, however, is required in our diet. The American Heart Association does this, states it this way, eat a variety of fish at least twice per week, especially uh, fish containing omega-3 fatty acids such as salmon, trout, and herring. Uh, the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in a typical Western diet is, is slanted toward omega-6, uh, maybe 10 to 15 uh, parts of omega-6 to omega-3, and many nutritionists, clinicians recommend that we get that closer to one to one. And how do we do that? Well, replace omega-6 containing foods with omega-3 containing foods would lead to a change in our dietary omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. Well, I'd like to turn our attention to uh, some potential health benefits uh, at this time. And uh, first, there's uh, been two general approaches to uh, try to study health benefits of something like a dietary constituent of omega-3 fatty acids. First of all, associate omega-3 fatty acid intake or a concentration in the blood with biomarkers of, or clinical markers of disease. In other words, do population comparisons um, to associate intake or kinds of foods with uh, disease outcomes, usually not large numbers of subjects, but because most of the diseases have been evaluated are multifactorial, it's difficult to draw specific Conclusions. But many uh, conclusions from population studies uh, suggest that omega-3 fatty acids seem to have some potential benefit. Now the other more intense um, method of doing those studies is to evaluate the effects of consuming known amounts of supplemental omega-3 fatty acids on disease risk factors, disease manifestations, and disease occurrence. And these are usually uh, short-term studies. Uh, and involved in smaller numbers. Um, and uh, the importance of these randomized clinical trials is that uh, you can compare one study with another through a statistical method known as meta-analysis to uh, get greater statistical power over associations of uh, dietary constituents such as omega-3 fatty acids to uh, uh, disease. Well, let's talk first about omega-3 fatty acids and cardiovascular disease. Population studies have uh, shown that people in Greenland, Northern Canada, Alaska have lower incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease than you'd expect uh, based on high fat intake. And, uh, and it presumably is related to the omega-3 fatty acid intake. Uh, second population study is that fish consuming Japanese have lower cardiovascular disease incidence. Uh, so many uh, trials, but not all, this is, uh, uh, I need to emphasize that, but not all, demonstrate that supplemental omega-3 fatty acids decrease risk factors for uh, cardiovascular disease. Well, what could uh, omega-3 fatty acids be doing? Well, they, they do seem to lower plasma triglycerides, um, and that would be a good thing regarding uh, cardiovascular disease development. They lower blood pressure. Of course, that would be a desirable thing. Uh, 
uh, property because higher blood pressure contributes to blood vessel damage that can lead to atherosclerosis. Lower inflammation because of omega-3s improve blood flow, especially in the heart and the brain would be a desirable thing, and that seems to improve with uh, in increased omega-3 fatty acids and diminished atherosclerosis, the process of accumulating plaque in the coronary arteries. And one of the authors presented this uh, slide to uh, a very complex slide, but the bottom line is, we start on the left, uh, the uh, low-density lipoproteins, LDL, have been associated very clearly with the development of cardiovascular disease. And uh, low-density lipoproteins undergo oxidation to become the LDL ox, as shown in the uh, slide. And they can be taken up by the uh, macrophage, shown at the lower center of the diagram. And macrophages uh, then accumulate lipid from uh, the LDL and, uh, and embed themselves in the growing plaque that then uh, in, uh, results in plaque development in the uh, coronary arteries or in the cerebral, cerebral uh, arteries of the brain. Uh, well, what can the, uh, the uh, omega-3 fatty acids do with this process? It seems that, uh, in, well, inflammation is a part of this overall uh, growth of plaque, and omega-3 fatty acids and decrease, which has been pretty clear, inflammation processes because of production of eicosanoids that are more anti-inflammatory anti and production of protectins and resolvents that minimize the effects of inflammation. So uh, the bottom line is that the presumed mechanism is, is occurring, the omega-3 fatty acids on atherosclerosis changing in the, uh, slowing down the rate at which uh, macrophages accumulate, become some foam cells and contribute to the development of plaque and smooth muscle proliferation, et cetera. The uh, major findings of meta-analyses have uh, shown that uh, uh, omega-3 fatty acids result in lower mortality of patients with existing cardiovascular disease. So if a person is known to have cardiovascular disease, data seems to suggest that uh, increased intake of omega-3 fatty acids is certainly desirable. And again, uh, the uh, mechanism is thought to, to result in this improvement is uh, the heart is more able to respond to stress. Uh, the anti-thrombotic action of mediators, because in the process of atherosclerosis leading to a heart disease, the plaque uh, results in the formation of a blood clot that contributes to the myocardial uh, infarct. Anti-inflammatory effect stabilizes that plaque to slow down the development of, of a blood clot. So bottom line is there seems to be uh, a positive effect of omega-3 fatty acids on cardiovascular disease prevention and uh, protection even after uh, cardiovascular disease is in a more advanced state. Well, same uh, Comments apply to omega-3 fatty acids and cancer. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids seem protective against cancer in many studies. And many of these are involving uh, fairly large doses of DHA and EPA in long chain omega-3s. Two grams per day is a common test dose. Uh, protective uh, in the uh, because the you know, omega-3 fatty acids become embedded, become a part of the lipid of the membrane that influences membrane structure and function in a positive way to uh, slow down the development of, of cancer, the initiation, the maintenance of uh, cancer. Uh, cell signaling, gene expression uh, is altered, uh, especially genes associated with cancer development. Uh, generation of lipid 
indicators occur that, uh, and all of those are probably not defined yet, but include molecules like the protectin and the solvents. And oxidative stress, uh, well, increases because omega-3 fatty acids are subject to oxidative stress, oxidation reactions. And that contributes to uh, apoptosis of cancer cells, and that's a good thing. Um, so there's some direct effects of uh, changes in fatty acid composition on uh, cancer cells in their environment and the host response to the tumor. So the omega-3s seem to prevent or slow the initiation process. Uh, the uh, protective effects have been shown for colorectal prostate, colorectal, prostate and breast cancers. Uh, and uh, it uh, seems that uh, cancer patients have uh, improved quality of life with greater uh, omega-3 fatty acid intake. And there seems to be an increased efficiency of chemotherapeutic agents, such as methotrexate, uh, on uh, the effectiveness of the drugs. Well, um, Brain disease, the brain disorder, brain function is also related to uh, especially uh, DHA and EPA intake. DHA is definitely an important component of neurolipids. Uh, DHA is essential for optimal vision, uh, neural and behavioral development, uh, especially in the young. Uh, the, uh, Data suggests that uh, omega-3 fatty acids, and especially uh, DHA status, is associated with brain, brain functions throughout life, uh, through also uh, on ADHD, schizophrenia, depression, and even Alzheimer's disease. However, I need to caution you that it's not black and white. It's a gray science, that's for sure. And we have to say the greater scientific evidence of protective effects uh, cancer development is uh, definitely needed uh, and of importance to all of us. Uh, Omega-3 fatty acids do uh, influence inflammation, and inflammation is involved in, in many uh, implant, in chronic diseases, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, and cardiovascular disease, all associated with inflammation and omega-3 fatty acids can minimize the inflammation process. Uh, we know that uh, omega-3 fatty acids and uh, arachidonic acid are precursors for uh, cosinoids, and that seems to be the uh, major uh, reason that inflammation is influenced. The uh, cosinoids and other mediators produced from the omega-3 fatty acids are less and less inflammatory or even anti-inflammatory and resolve inflammation. Uh, it's been uh, shown in some recent studies that uh, long-chain uh, EPA, DHA uh, supplementation for pregnant mothers decreases the likelihood of allergy and lessens <coughs> asthma incidence in children. And that's a good thing. So the overall effect seems to be the omega-3 fatty acids lessen the effect of inflammatory conditions and have a, a positive effect on the immune system. Well, uh, because of some of the potential health benefits, there's great interest in increasing omega-3 fatty acid content of our diet. And one way to do that is to increase the content of omega-3s in common foods that we consume. Um, Increasing oleic acid at the expense of linoleic acid in soy oil can have a positive effect because of the, the uh, process I mentioned earlier where linoleic acid can negatively impact the production of EPA and DHA from linolenic acid. So replacing oleic with, lin with oleic acid, making high, so high oleic acid soy oil, uh, could influence uh, our EPA DHA status. Another uh, emphasis has, in research has been to uh, uh, genetically modify soybeans, for example, to uh, increase the amount of 
steroidonic acid. And steroidonic acid is a precursor for EPA and DHA. And uh, steroidonic acid is more efficiently converted to EPA and DHA than is linolenic acid. So that seems to be uh, some, of some significance. Another is to alter the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 ratio in the foods that we consume or even genetically engineer uh, plants to uh, contain uh, EPA and DHA, which are normally found in, in uh, fish and seafoods. But what about increasing omega-3 fatty acids in uh, animal-derived foods? Uh, well, many of you have probably heard of omega-3 eggs or uh, omega-3 rich eggs. Uh, by feeding omega-3 uh, foods to chickens and pigs, the uh, dietary omega-3 fatty acids can be directly <coughs> transferred to the egg or to the uh, pork that we uh, gain from pigs. So that can be an effective way of increasing our omega-3 fatty acid intake through uh, those modifications. Uh, it's the uh, dietary impact of omega-3 fatty acids on the composition of beef and milk is much less uh, effective because of biohydrogenation of the polyunsaturated fatty acids in the rumen of cattle. Um, and so the major end product of uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids is uh, saturated fatty acids. And so the uh, omega-3 fatty acids are largely uh, saturated. Uh, beef and milk from grass-fed cattle, however, have uh, greater amounts of linolenic acid than uh, cattle fed on high grain diets. So there's some uh, interest in that technology of, of uh, feeding cattle uh, to improve uh, linolenic acid and common omega-3 fatty acid. Same thing with fish. Feeding omega-3 rich foods to uh, fish will increase the omega-3 fatty acid content, for example, of catfish and other farmed fish. And there's, of course, potential of genetic engineering seed plants to produce EPA and DHA. Well, uh, what kind of claims can be put on packages of food about omega-3 fatty acids? Uh, the uh, FDA says, or tells the uh, states that health claims describe a relationship between a food substance and reduced risk of disease on health-related conditions. And there's some guides for that. Uh, the Nutrition Labeling and Education Act of 1990 establishes standards for uh, making claims, the FDA Modernization Act. And uh, there are some quality health claims where EPA and DHA uh, may reduce coronary heart disease. Uh, that uh, has been uh, published. A uh, nutrient content claim uh, has been made for linolenic acid. Uh, it can be stated that the uh, nutrient content of uh, ALA or alpha linolenic acid is high. It is greater than 320 milligrams of LAA, ALA per serving, RACC equivalent to a serving. Or it's a good source if it's 160 milligrams of ALA, ALA per serving. Uh, or more if it's greater than 160 milligrams of ALA more per uh, serving than the appropriate reference. Uh, structural function claims uh, such as uh, calcium leads to strong bones. That would be an example of a structure function claim. And the structure function claims that have been established for uh, the omega-3 fatty acids are listed here, four of them are. Uh, DHA supports brain and eye development and function. The data is strong enough to uh, allow that particular structure function claim. Uh, DHA is the most abundant omega-3 fatty acid in the brain. Omega-3 fatty acids support a healthy heart. EPA and DHA are precursors of mycosinoids that have many well-documented health benefits. 
So we'll probably see some more in the future. We could see more in the future with uh, additional research. Uh, we'll see how that goes. So I'd like to conclude uh, this presentation by summarizing these uh, 11 statements and then open the uh, floor for discussion. Uh, first of all, ALA, EPA, and DHA are the most common omega-3 fatty acids in our diet. Uh, ALA, that is alpha-linolenic acid, is essential in the diet. EPA and DHA are synthesized from ALA. Uh, flax, chia, Seafood, fish oils, and algae are rich in omega-3 fatty acids. Those are potential sources of, of uh, omega-3s in our diet. Um, fourth statement, supplementation is safe and seems beneficial. An upper tolerable limit has uh, been suggested to be something like 22 grams a day. So if there's uh, essentially a uh, no problem with safety uh, within reason for omega-3 fatty acids and their supplementation seems beneficial. Um, DHA supports optimal neurocognitive development, especially in young. And uh, now, of course, uh, we know that DHA is common in breast milk and that many of the artificial milks for babies are supplemented now with DHA and uh, EPA. Omega-3 fatty acids, number six, are associated with lower risk for cardiovascular disease. Number seven, omega-3 fatty acids are probably protective against cancer. Number eight, supplementation of diets with omega-3 fatty acids increases the content in, uh, in poultry, eggs, and pork, but much less so in, in beef and milk uh, as agricultural practices. Number nine, plants can be modified to increase the content of omega-3 fatty acids. Federal guidelines are supportive of increasing intake of omega-3 fatty acids, and many authorities recommend increasing the intake of uh, EPA and DHA. So I thank you for your attention, and uh, appreciate uh, uh, you uh, listening to our dis my discussion about the omega-3 fatty acids. Thank you very much. If you're interested in additional information about this paper, you can visit our CAS website. Uh, there are the executive summaries that I passed out that are free to download, and there is a small charge to download the hard copy of the, uh, uh, of the publication, but we would encourage you to do so. At this point, I would open the floor if there's any questions or comments or um, if there are questions you'd like to direct to uh, Dr. Bites. Well, thank you for all your interest in talking and your presentation. So I have two basic questions. So what the lifespan of a DHA and EPA must get been taken into human body and uh, before they get converted into other molecules? And the other question is, is there dosage side effect? Without anything, if you take too much, is there side effect on it? So the first question is the uh, lifetime of DHA and EPA in, uh, in our bodies. In other words, the half-life of EPA and DHA. I, uh, I honestly don't know if that's been evaluated. It probably has, but I don't know what it is. Uh, EPA and DHA get incorporated into uh, um, brain lipid, lipids throughout our body and because uh, all the membranes are phospholipid containing um, structures. Uh, the lifetime of EPA and DHA in, in the brain, I honestly don't know, but I'm sure it's more than hours and probably more than days. Um, so, I'm sorry, I, I don't have a specific number, and I don't remember reading any experiments where that's been quantified. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? Or comments or additions? I, I may have missed it. You showed there's some clear designations for ALA, for like good source, excellent source, but for DHA and EPA, there isn't. And 
kind of why not? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I uh, have to ask our FDA officials. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. question is, uh, does uh, physical activity or exercise influence the rate at which uh, ALA is converted to EPA and DHA? Um, my goodness, I'm trying to think of why would exercise influence the uh, elongation desaturation process? Um, I, uh, that, no, that's, a very, that's a very intriguing question. We hear so many benefits of physical activity, increasing blood flow, raising HDL, but does it increase, uh, have some of the positive effect, effects uh, by increasing EPA and DHA synthesis? I, uh, I'm not coming up with anything. I'm very sorry, and I don't know the literature on that as much as, so. But thanks for that interesting idea. I'm gonna give some more thought to that. Yes. I just thought I would um, shed some light on the Sam's question. The reason that we can't have a good and excellent source on EPA and DHA is because from the IOM, we all, all we have is an adequate intake, the adequate intake level you mentioned is specific for ALA, alpha monolamic acid. And they make a claim we really should have an RDA, but all we have is an adequate intake, and so there was legislation that allowed there to be a good and excellent source on ALA only. Thank you very much for that. That's, yeah, makes sense. Well, if there's uh, no more questions, I can. Yeah. Again, I'd just like to wrap up with Ray Don's comment. Thank you for your attention today. Um, if you're interested in uh, information about CAST, who we are, what we do, uh, please uh, visit our website. It's www.castscience.org. And uh, we are always, uh, looking for new members, whether they be the individuals or companies or scientific societies. We have a number of universities that are members. We use that as a way to help disseminate uh, uh, science-based information about food and agriculture to kind of broader audiences within the university community. So thank you for your attention and have a good day. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Are they a, are you a member?